Saturn 2888 says, I would love to hear about mistakes you've made, even measuring unrelated to inserting through, through whole feet. You got me there. And what it was like in the early days. Allow me to meander a bit for this answer because it's, it's, it's not really complex, but there's a lot of different avenues and things that kind of overlap. So going back to maybe the late 2000s, I got into car audio really heavily as far as measurements go. And what I was really trying to do was understand, I like this sound or I don't like this sound. How can I quantify it into something that is more repeatable? And that entered the RTA, which is the real-time analyzer. I started using True RTA initially, and then I used Smart Life, and I also used REW. Uh, REW initially to me was just so overwhelming. I, d- I didn't know how to use it that I went back to True RTA, but then eventually I went back to REW, and that's pretty much what I use solely at this point in time. Around that same time point, I started looking at raw drive unit measurements, just you know, like a raw mid-range or a raw tweeter or a raw mid-base drive unit. And the reason that I started being interested in that is because I wanted to understand how do you know when you're getting a product that A, matches what the manufacturer says it will, and B, you know, is worth the price. And that got me into the DIY realm of things. And around 2010, I got associated with DIY Mobile Audio, and that's when I started testing drive units for them. I quit doing that after like a year or two. I don't remember the exact timeline, but somewhere around a year or two because the owner of the website was emailed by another manufacturer whose product I had reviewed. And there was some kind of drama going back and forth. And I, you know, honestly, I wouldn't mind mentioning the name of that brand, but the owner is so far dismissed from that brand now that I don't want to give it a bad image at this point. So I don't think it behooves anyone to to dig up that particular detail from the past. But suffice it to say, I did not like that whole interaction. And I said, I'm just going to stop reviewing speakers for this website. And I quit for about maybe six months. And then I reached out to Clipple, contacted them, got my own distortion analyzer to started measuring raw drive units myself. And then I got into home audio drive units from Mattisound, uh, Parts Express. Sometimes I would order cabinets. I think one of my first concentric driviness that I ever measured was I ordered some Kef, I think it was the Q100 at the time, plucked the speakers out or plucked the driviness out, measured those. And then I did the same thing with their R, is it the 5 or R500, R300, which used the dedicated three-way mid-range version of the coaxial. And then, you know, around, uh, I don't know, maybe 2015 or so, some stuff was going on in my personal life with my kid and I needed to stop. I needed to put the focus back on her and her health. So I quit doing that. And I think I think it was 2015. Then when COVID came around, like most of you, I was in the home and I was thinking, I didn't have a lot to do, right? I was watching a lot of television because I couldn't go anywhere else. And I saw a lot of reviewers and I thought, man, these guys, you know, they're good salesmen, but they don't really have the technical chops to talk about the inner workings. And I felt like that was a segment that was severely lacking in the YouTube space. So I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to make make my my own way in that regard. And I knew that it wasn't going to be something that would take off. But I did want to, the stuff that I was doing on my own, I was already measuring things. I thought, I'll just make it public now. You know, so I had a website way back in the day and It was called medleysmusings.com, which is the stupidest name. I get it now. But anyway, that was my middle name or is my middle name. And I basically just said, I'm going to dump that website. I'm going to bring up a new one, Aaron's Audio Corner. I'm just going to republish all my old data onto my website, but I'm going to continue to publish new data on there. And then I'll make YouTube videos. And I go back and look at some of them now and they were terrible. I read a quote at one point. It was basically saying, like, if you look back on a year a go of yourself and you're not, I don't know if they said a shame, but basically it was like, if you don't feel like you've improved, then (laughs) like, what are you doing? Right. So luckily I do feel like I've improved somewhat at least in that regard, but yes. So now that I've gotten that out of the way and kind of giving you like a very brief history of how I got to where I am right now in what is this June, 2024. Yeah, man, I've made some mistakes. So one mistake that I can tell you about, I'll tell you a couple others, but one that always makes me laugh is 
I was testing a rhythmic subwoofer. And back then what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the raw subwoofer out of the enclosure and test the raw subwoofer to see what its linear excursion was per an IEC standard. And then that way, you know, we would know like, hey, if the subwoofer drive unit itself is really good, then when you put it in the enclosure, what are you gonna get? You know, the two parts make a whole. So I had set the output voltage to some high number, right? And that was to give a lot of power to the raw drive unit. And then when it came time to test the enclosed unit with the powered amplifier as part of the enclosure, I can't remember why, but ultimately what I did was I said I fed that same voltage that would have gone into an amplifier and came out as power straight into the the drive unit, well, I fed that same voltage into the power amplifier. So normally you would feed like maybe two volts gets you max amplifier power, right? I fed it like 20 or 25 volts and all I heard was and then that was it. Like the voice coil just locked up, it froze, it was, it was a done deal. So I had to call Rhythmic and tell them what I'd done. I, I honestly, I feel like I wanna say I paid about $200 for my mistake but they may have just sent me a replacement, but I, it seems to my memory that I actually paid literally for my mistake because that was probably the right thing to do anyway, right? I mean, I messed it up. So yeah, I fried a subwoofer that way. Um, <laughs> when I first started testing for my website and this YouTube channel, I had gotten some Revel F226BE tower speakers. And back then I was testing speakers outside and I was doing it two different methods. I was doing a ground plane method, and then I was also doing a quasi-anechoic method. And you may wonder if you don't know, what's the difference? Well, in short, a quasi-anechoic method is where you measure a speaker typically off the ground, and then what you do is you gate out the first reflection. So you look at the impulse response and you say, the first reflection is off the ground at approximately three milliseconds or so. And that's typically what it is. I think in my case, it was like nine milliseconds. And you would basically say, all right, everything after this point in time, ignore because it's reflection based. So that gets you, you know, semi good data, depending on the length of reflectionless window that you're using, you can get better resolution and more accurate data down to lower frequencies. So three milliseconds usually gets you, let's say like 333 Hertz of resolution free windowing. And then the higher you go, basically the better. But because I have to gate, that window out, right? I had to gate that reflection out. My data was only good down to a certain frequency. So then I would measure it using the ground plane method, which is where you literally set the speaker on the ground and you set the microphone about two meters away and you run the sweep through it and then you get accurate data up to a certain frequency, right? And so that certain frequency is gonna depend on a lot of things that I'm not gonna discuss right now. If you guys want a separate video on it, I'm happy to go into detail, but it take too much time. So that kind of met up with the lower limit of my quasi-anechoic. So let's say it was about 400 hertz. So I had about 100 hertz of overlap. Now, in order to do full spinorama, you have to have 70 measurement points. That meant that I was doing 140 measurement points. And I was doing this stuff in the summertime in Alabama. And sometimes I was waiting until 10 o'clock at night. So it would be cool enough because I would literally just be dripping sweat. And I would worry about my computer overheating otherwise. Well, I was testing that Revel speaker and I was trying to do the ground plane method. I had it standing up and I had the craziest rig um, to get it to stay in place. Well, I ran over to my computer and hit go and, and started to run the measurement. And no sooner than I got to my computer, it just fell over. And it fell over onto the platter or the plinth, the bottom of the speaker, and it just broke apart the bottom of it. This was the first speaker I think that a manufacturer had sent me. And I, my, like everything I had just went straight into my gut. I felt sick to my stomach because they were four or $5,000 a pair, I think at that time, they might've been a little bit more. I called Eva, I believe was her name, and she was a Harmon um, associate. She was a marketing associate. And I told her what happened and she was basically like, look, stuff happens, don't worry about it. That's why we have demo pairs. So yeah, that sucked, that really sucked. And for what it's worth, here's a quick picture of when I was testing that speaker, trying to do a quasi anechoic for the vertical plane where you basically spinning around the tweeter axis, but with it sitting on its side, so you get the vertical response. This was sketchy. This is Redneck Engineering 101. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is 
this channel. I don't know how to really say this without potentially making other people mad. So I'll just say that, please believe me when I say that I'm not trying to make anybody else mad. I'm not trying to call anybody out. Listen, I would like to grow this channel. I'm not going to lie. It would be cool if this channel grew and it hit higher numbers. Because I think getting the word out about the importance of having reliable data to go along with reviews is really important. It's something I really believe in. And the more people that that reaches, the more, the better products that we're going to get. Because then consumers will start saying, hey, well, do you have at least, you know, the on-axis response? Like, you don't have nothing. Like, do you have on, on and off, maybe? Like, zero, 15, 30, 60 degrees? Like, do you have that at least? And the more consumers demand those kind of things, the more, or the better product that we're going to get. I mean, really, I, I, there's no other way to say it. But in order to grow this channel, I would have to do certain things that I don't necessarily want to do. Like, I don't want to do dumb looking thumbnails. Right? Like I, and I've tried it before and every single time I'm like, that's not me. Like, I don't want to do that. And I feel like growing your channel that way may bring you a lot of views, but it also brings you a lot of people that you probably don't want right in the community. Like just negative Nancy's really just bad attitudes. And then I don't want that. So there's that balance of trying to find how do I spread this message to ultimately provide us all with a better product, at least that's what I think, without resorting to clickbait stuff or without resorting to thumbnails that I'm just like, I don't feel like that's what is good for me. It's a good fit for me personally. And I would really genuinely like to hear your all feedback on what you think about that. And please don't say so-and-so does this and I think it's dumb. Like, don't name names. I don't want it to be about that. I would genuinely just appreciate your input and your insight and how you view other channels and, and why you click on certain videos and what it is that grabs your attention. Because I, I could do the clickbait stuff and I could get you to come in. Sometimes my rule about clickbait is I can make it clickbaity-ish as long as I'm covering the topic in the video. And I'm always covering the topic in the video but, you know, like a kind of a junky, sleazy kind of, you know, like this thing is better than this thing. And it's like, well, it might be in this way, but not this way. And it's those really hardly defined lines and attitudes that I think do a tremendous disservice to the community. You know, I, and I get that I'm probably sounding like I'm on a high horse and I think I'm like better than other people. I get that. If that's how it's viewed, okay, because I'm not changing my words of how I say it. I really, truly believe that the way that some of this stuff has gone about is not, not beneficial to the community, maybe to the industry as a whole, but like, who am I to say that, right? That's just my opinion. The other side of this is that my buddy Joe and Tell will often say, you know, it's not even, it, it's that's what people click on, right? So if you're clicking on that as somebody who is reviewing products and I'm looking and I'm seeing like, well, these other people are getting a lot of views and they're doing this thing. Like, does that mean that in order to get attention that I'm going to have to do that too? I don't want to resort to that. I've been doing this for four years now, four years. And I probably couldn't name more than maybe a couple videos that I felt like I went beyond what I felt comfortable with. But I'm not going to lie and say that there hasn't been a lot of temptation over those four years to do the kind of things that I know will garner views, but go against what I want to do as a person. So this is where I'm soliciting your responses. What is it that captures your attention? Is there something that I'm not doing that you feel would be beneficial, not necessarily in topics, but just how I'm presenting things? And I've got some ideas that I'm going to try to work through. But throw out some of your own ideas and I'll read every single one of them. I may not reply to them all because I'm trying to set a limit on my social media, but I will certainly read them all and take them to heart. And 
honestly, uh, just honestly, I appreciate every single one of you watching these videos. I appreciate every single one of you sharing the information with your friends. I don't want this to be a toxic community, and I don't think that it is. I think a few years ago, it was really toxic. It was like subjective versus objective, and I'm not even talking about that anymore. Like, I'm, I'm way past that. Um, who was it that was on Jay-Z's track? He was featured to say, we off that. I don't think it was Drake, but it might have been, but we off that. It was a Jay-Z track. Anyway, let me know what you think about that particular topic. I would be personally, personally curious. And um, yeah, be paying attention for my upcoming video. Hopefully it's going to be the SBS. I'm still waiting on the part from Clipple to get here so I can measure it. And then once I do, I'll be able to, to start getting out some of those reviews that I've got boxes and boxes just stacked up in my garage waiting for me. You all take care of yourself. Take care of your mental state. Please. Do good things, do positive things. Try to go to bed an hour early, at least one night this week and wake up early so the next morning you can get started and feel positive. I've been doing that the past week and it seems to be working. So I'm trying to pass that bit of information on. Just do what you need to do. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.